My world also merged with a game, and the age of classes reached everyone in order to survive it. I, I also gained a rare class. I am a thief. I had no idea of my power until they came after me. To you, my friend, don't need an ask, don't play pretend You think you are everything I need, but I'm gonna leave Parallel to Earth, there exists a world called the Azure Star. A hundred years ago, a game called Dawn arrived in this world. Since then, monsters, bosses, and even evil gods from the game have constantly threatened the world. The only way to survive was to awaken a profession and become a professional. An angel, warrior, elf, or mage. Thus, people ventured into the game, fought monsters, and progressed to become the strongest. Within the game, there was an arena where a kind of class test and the choice of each person's profession took place. Sun Xiaoli is called to the center, just below a huge black crystal, and then it is announced that she has successfully awakened the profession of Master Blacksmith. A nearby group mocks, saying that this profession is useless, and begins to laugh uncontrollably. One of them remembers, laughing, that in the early stages, this crafting profession only allows for improvement by purchasing materials, which is considerably expensive, and the friends agree. The instructor asks for silence and announces that the next is Wang Tianqi a member of the group of mockers. Wang Tianqi approaches with an arrogant air and a malicious smile, as if he is certain that he will receive something very good. And so it happens. He awakens the profession of paladin. His friends boast and acclaim the brother Wang's achievement, as the paladin profession is rare and receiving it is a great honor. The instructor tries to silence the group and expels them from the location, as Wang Tianqi had already been awakened and was wasting the time of others. The group walks away laughing, the instructor takes his list and with attention announces that the next is Zhou Yi. The young man approaches, drawing attention with his impeccable appearance. The girls around him whisper, admiring his beauty and posture. Zhou touches one of the fragments of the floating stone and a black smoke exhales around him, announcing that his awakened profession is that of thief, a rare profession. The spectators are surprised by the announcement, and some express great envy as this profession allows stealing items, causing the most damage to single targets and even becoming invisible. A pop-up shows more details of the profession, leaving Zhou astonished. Wang Tianqi disdains the choice, saying that Zhou Yi is not skilled with thief weapons, making the profession useless, even though he has awakened to it. One of his friends adds that he heard Zhou had been practicing with a two-handed sword for a long time because he wanted to become a warrior, and that's why he was a bit dazed. For the group, this was a great waste of a profession, and it would take at least a year for Joe to develop the skills, without even lasting a minute at the beginner level. Zhou Yi ignored the mockery, focusing on the pop-up in front of him. Each profession comes with a unique ability, and for a thief, this ability is the Eye of Death, Joe contemplated. The Eye of Death sees through the opponent's weakness, causing 100% real damage for 5 seconds. The cooldown time is 25 seconds. However, continuing to stare at the system screen, he saw the Godly Hand ability, an active skill that can steal items, skills, and attributes from the target, with a maximum use of two times per target. Its cooldown time is 30 seconds and its range is 2 meters. Joe knew that this Godly Hand should not be a theft skill possessed by common thieves, as common thieves can only steal coins. But the Godly Hand can steal accessories, attributes, and even skills. This impressed him greatly. The game system screen also informed that a new exclusive passive skill has been added, Mastery of Weapons. This passive skill did not seem very useful at first glance, he thought. In the pop-up, it described that Mastery of Weapons allowed the unrestricted use of any weapon, and Zhou Yi thought that perhaps with it, he could become a thief with a two-handed sword. Would that be possible? Putting the weapons aside, Zhou Yi reflected on the godly hand ability. Clearly, it was not a skill of a common thief. Would this be his trump card or a kind of hack? The instructor approached Zhou, placing his hand on his shoulder and asked him not to listen to the nonsense of Wang's group, assuring that Zhou would still have time to pass the beginner's test. 
He instructed Joe to go back and familiarize himself with the thief profession. Joe Yi responded to the teacher not to worry, as he had awakened a truly rare profession, which people normally don't even dream of obtaining. He turned to Wang's group and with determination said he would complete the beginner's test and show them how it's done. The group laughed and scoffed, saying they didn't care which profession Joe was assigned. After all, a common thief can only sneak around like a shadow. Furthermore, they claimed that Joe could not compare to Brother Wang, who was stronger and more resilient. They warned Zhou Yi not to cross their path in the future. As he was configuring his nickname, Zhou Yi imagined how mistaken the boys were in thinking that a thief could only move unnoticed. They would see him frequently in the future. A system notification indicated that the nickname was successfully set. A window opened asking Joe, now updated to Death Star, to add a new profile picture. He ignored the request and decided to use his own face, skipping the pop-up. The next window asked Death Star to choose his new starting weapon, and without hesitation, he chose the two-handed sword, as it was every man's dream. With everything ready, Joe was ready to enter the beginner's zone as the player Death Star. In a five-second countdown, Joe entered the game, starting with a 0% success rate. His clothes changed, and new equipment was added to his visual. He found it quite convenient that his new outfit was just a click away. A system alert announced that the first wave of monsters was coming. Everything around him turned red, as if he could feel a threatening presence in the area. A horde of goblins crept through the trees with bloodthirsty red eyes. One of them quickly approached with a club in hand, and Joe, grabbing his sword, announced that he was waiting for them because he wanted to test his new hacks. He waited until the goblins got close, and then one of the creatures jumped in his direction, and our protagonist activated the godly hand. His hand began to glow as he extended it towards the goblin. The system alerted him. An attribute point. Skills, none. Weapon, large staff, goblin teeth. His expression showed that it was not very satisfactory, and then he thought, why is it a staff? Can I steal skills or attributes? The creature looked confused, looking at its empty hands, not understanding what had happened. That's when the system informed, hint, you can only randomly steal one of the items, skills or attributes, so that the real combat prevails. Outraged and with a crying face, our protagonist shouted while hitting the system screen, Are you kidding me? This makes the person feel so powerful, but isn't it just a scam against the consumer? Without even realizing it, one of the goblins grunted loudly, raising his staff, opening his mouth full of teeth while shouting, Die! Leaving Joe completely frozen, not knowing very well what to do, until with the stolen staff he blocked the attack, trying to sustain his strength even with his trembling hands. Although some attempts did not result in skills, he understood that the hand of God was more effective when combined with the exclusive abilities of the thief. The high agility combined with the greater damage base of the two-handed sword allowed him to easily dominate the beginner-level goblins. The Eye of Death allowed him to visualize the weaknesses of the goblins and deliver precise blows. Using this ability in conjunction with weapon mastery, a single blow to the monster's skull opened a new alert window warning that the blow had caused critical and double damage. The second wave of goblins was approaching, and this time, Zhou Yi was more focused, calling the monsters to the fight with a grim smile on his face. He positioned his sword with mastery and attacked the entire horde at once. His attributes increased by 16 points, and he advanced to level 2. Zhou entered his profile and checked his health and skill levels. He was waiting for the next challenge, which would be to face the supreme boss, known to be impossible to defeat. Joe heard footsteps approaching. The new monster ordered the insignificant beings to kneel down. Joe recognized that voice. He prepared for battle and was stunned to realize that it was his own sister. Joe Yi was confronted with the Night Vixen, the Demon Knight Lil, a boss with high values of vitality, magic, attack, and defense, as well as devastating abilities. The boss was a kimono mimi with tiger characteristics, her pointed and furry ears, a snout-like nose, a long tail, even with the family bond, his determination to defeat her did not diminish. Lil quickly jumped, positioning herself right in front of Joe. He questioned how his sister had arrived there. Lil stared at Zhou Yi with a graceful smile, seeing only a small thief carrying a two-handed sword, and this was certainly a great source of amusement. However, he was prepared and was not shaken by the taunts. With a determined gesture, he activated the Hand of God ability. A blue glow radiated from his hand, forming a beam of light that floated in the air before heading towards Lil. The ability did not cause immediate damage, but Zhou Yi knew that the best strategy was to catch Lil off guard. She turned her head to look at Zhou and mocked her brother, saying that the blow didn't even hurt her. A new pop-up appeared, 
informing that Joe still had one more chance to steal from the same target, as the first attempt had yielded a staff. In the new attempt, he managed to steal a ring from Lil, but he found it useless. The demon knight Lil, realizing the loss, screamed furiously, demanding her ring back. Zhou Yi, although surprised, remained calm. Seeing that he still had to wait another minute while the hand of God recharged, he tried to distract Lil to gain time. He put on the ring and used sarcastic compliments, distracting Lil for a moment. While Lil, inflamed by vanity, was lost in thought, Zhou Yi observed the surroundings. He needed Lil to get closer, within a range of two meters. The hand of God recharge was almost complete, and Joe began to taunt Lil maliciously. Lil, realizing the trick, was enraged. Her dark aura intensified, and a red energy surrounded her body. All the demon knight's attributes increased by 30%, making her an almost unbearable presence. Joe Yi felt the suffocating pressure, but he didn't give up. The hand of God recharge was complete, and he knew that this challenge was worth it. He activated the ability again. Lil ran furiously in leaps to attack Joe, but he knew his tactic would work. In his first blow, he managed to dodge, causing even more rage in the boss. With voraciousness, she raised her paw and said, Go to hell, you little thief! An explosion of energy engulfed them both. Lil realized that her attacks were blocked by Joe's sword. That was not just a mere ornament, but her end. She was close enough now. Joe looked at her with a bloodied face and told her he had a surprise for his sister. He activated the hand of God and directed it at her again, resulting in the successful theft of the Ten Steps ability. When Lil tried to use her final attack, she realized that she no longer had that ability. Zhou Yi, now with the stolen skill, activated the Eye of Death. His eyes shone in an intense red, allowing him to see Lil's weaknesses. She felt that something was wrong and quickly looked behind her, thinking, How can he use my skill? He advanced, his two-handed sword emitting a bluish glow, amplifying his damage. Lil stared at her brother, not knowing how this was possible. The battle reached its climax when Zhou Yi delivered the blow. The combined ability resulted in an explosion that illuminated the forest. The massive damage resulted in Lil's defeat as she fell at Zhou's feet. She asked how this was possible, who he had become, and how a common thief had overcome so many restrictions at once. He looked at her coldly, the energy still circulating through him as he introduced himself as the Death Star. The game system recognized his victory. Joe stated that Lil was worthy of being considered a supreme boss compared to the goblins. Her level was much higher, but the combination of his blows was more powerful than he could have imagined. With a luminous fanfare, a forbidden treasure chest appeared before him, radiating a golden light that contrasted with the surrounding darkness. The news spread quickly in the world of dawn, and everyone questioned who this Death Star was as they stared at the game system screens. What profession could he have to defeat a supreme boss? That was incredible. In a nearby church called the Church of the End, a powerful evil creature wrapped in reddish flames admired the abilities of the Death Star. The creature surmised that he had a powerful soul and that his sacrifice would be enough to resurrect his master. Therefore, it sent its subordinates to find and capture him. At the Blue Star Federation, a sumptuous building right in the center of the city, a group gathered to devise a strategy to protect the Death Star from the Church of the End as they knew they would be after the player. The leader's order was that the group should spare no effort to protect him at all costs. Back to our protagonist, who sneezed at the same moment, suggesting they were talking about him, Zhou Yi was eager to open the chest and discover what was inside. Upon opening it, an intense light emanated, revealing within it the golden legend, promising new adventures and challenges. In this game world, amidst the imposing trees and dense shadows of the forest, Zhou Yi reflected on the various types of treasure chests that existed. There were simple wooden chests, shiny golden chests, and the unique and dazzling diamond chests. However, among them all, one stood out as the most precious. The forbidden treasure chest. Sword of Damocles, he murmured, recalling the deadly characteristics of the weapon. It was a feared throwing blade, capable of inflicting 400% physical damage and 300% electrical damage to any creature within a 30-meter radius of the target. To upgrade it, it was necessary to defeat 10,000 monsters, increasing its effect with an additional 30% true damage to enemies' health. With this sword, I'm not just a warrior, but a kind of walking nuclear bomb, he thought with a cunning smile. On a quiet afternoon at Zhou Yi's house, located in Building 6, Apartment 666, the events took an unexpected turn. An unexpected visitor arrived. The sudden arrival caused a stir, especially when Zhou assumed that his sister had returned. He quickly logged out of the game system and hid his username before investigating who it really was. 
Upon answering the door, Joe was confronted with a strange hooded figure. Who are you? Joe Yi asked, trying to maintain his composure while dealing with the intrusion. I would like to introduce our church to you, exclaimed the visitor enthusiastically. He continued to say that he believed his great lord of the end was the one who would guide the reconstruction of the world, that he was the beginning of everything, and that the awakening and his rare professions were guided by the great lord, so he was there to invite Joe to join the church. Joe Yi felt a chill as he realized it was a cult organization, and that man with the glazed eyes frightened him. How could they have found him, he thought, feeling an increasing discomfort with the situation. Thank you, but it's not necessary, he replied, trying to politely decline the invitation. As he tried to dismiss the mysterious man, he began to dial the authorities' number on his phone. The rejection was not well received. The cultist seemed nervous, suggesting that Zhou Yi call the authorities to deal with the situation. The man held the door, preventing Zhou from closing it. The tension escalated quickly. Zhou realized that he was not an ordinary person, but someone endowed with an abnormal strength. The cultist forced the door open, invading Joe's house again, questioning if he was calling the police. A dark force filled the environment. The cultist held in his hands a kind of sword, and this power took over his face, making it even more macabre. He said maliciously that he would send Joe Yi straight to his master, threatening to kill the boy. And then, a red light left a trail in the air due to the blow invoked by the cultist. Joe projected himself backwards, and in the midst of the confusion invoked his special ability, Hand of God, trying to disarm the opponent, steal his abilities, and use them to weaken him. However, he discovered, through a system notification, that the ability could not be used against humans, frustrating his plans. Joe was not prepared for that confrontation. He looked at the knife that was on the table and grabbed it, intending to try to defend himself with it, combining it with his weapon mastery ability. He then activated the Eye of Death and was thus able to identify the man's weakness. And there was the cultist marked by the sight of the ability. It didn't take long for him to swiftly attempt to deliver a fatal blow, leaving only a red trail between the two. The man from the Church of the End realizes the tactic and recognizes that he underestimated Joe, but adds that the only consequence of rejecting the church and daring to call the police is death. He advances with full speed towards Zhou Yi, who, alarmed and tense, tries to defend himself by trying to hit the man's weak spot on his back, but it's out of reach. Suddenly, the blade charges with crimson energy with black lightning circling the sword, grazing him. When he thinks he's going to lose, something hits the fanatic right in the head, making him fall to the ground. Stunned, Zhou stares at the lunatic on the ground without realizing that behind him, there were two shadowy figures standing at the door of his apartment. The two mysterious figures, one of them carrying a bow and arrows, ask if he's okay. The man with the bow approaches closer and reassures Joe, saying that he is safe now. The woman with him wielding a gun checks the cultist member, identifies him, and reports to her captain that he is indeed dead. The man puts his hand on Joe's shoulder, indicating that they should leave while the crime scene is cleaned up. Joe, dazed, follows him outside. Thirty minutes later, still outside his building, Zhou Yi hears the explanation of who the man who attacked him was. He discovers that it was a member of an organized cult that emerged after the Dawn game and that they specialize in killing professional players for fun and don't give up easily once they choose a target. The captain of the Blue Star Federation warns that if this happens again, Zhou Yi should notify them immediately. Zhou Yi thanks them for the help, and the agent's car drives away. While watching the car drive away, a girl approached with hurried steps, calling him Little Yi. She asked what was going on there and why the police had been called. Getting closer, she asked if he was okay and if someone had bothered him, leaving him a little embarrassed. But Zhou Yi quickly walked away, saying everything was fine and that it was just routine questions. The girl was his sister, who almost fell face first to the ground, but he indifferently insisted, asking to go home soon. They returned to the apartment and the girl continued asking questions. She wanted to know how Zhou Yi's day had been, what profession he had awakened, and what his username was so she could add him. Zhou Yi made a bored face and his sister questioned why he was sad, claiming that it didn't matter what profession he had chosen, since she had a good salary and could support them both. Zhou Yi pushed the girl away again, saying he was sleepy, went upstairs, and left his sister behind. She watched her brother go up the stairs with a wistful look, remembering the day Zhou Yi was adopted into their family. This happened 18 years ago, on a rainy day when a baby was abandoned at the door of a restaurant and then adopted by his sister's family, Zhou Xingyu. On that day, the girl was very happy and promised to take care of her new brother. They did not expect Zhou Xingyu's parents to pass away so soon and so suddenly. 
Yi promised that Xing Yu would always have him around. The memories flooded Yi's thoughts, especially the agent statement that he was still a novice, which meant that Yi could not reveal his profession to his sister without putting her in great danger. He clenched his fists with a look of anger and determination, promising himself that when he became strong enough, he would tell Xing Yu about his profession. In a place called Mingyue Village, within the game, Zhou Yi accesses the system and checks that he is still at level 3. If he wants to level up quickly, he will need to take on more missions, as they provide good rewards and increase experience. Remembering that the mentor of the thief profession is present, he decides he should learn his skills first before looking for other missions. Nearby, two other players comment on the achievements of the player Death Star. One of them, with sarcasm and arrogance, mentions that Death Star was not the first to pass the final test, minimizing his accomplishments. The other, in turn, claims to be a friend of the new player, Zhou Yi, and promises to deal with the arrogant one, stating that he and Death Star grew up and trained together. Observing the discussion from afar, Zhou Yi found the situation amusing. Situation am Zhou Yi finds the thief master surrounded by women and drinks, relaxing on a sofa in the corner of the bar. He approaches and asks the master to teach him new skills. The master is annoyed, saying that there is always a novice bothering him while he's having fun, and rejects him with disdain. He then suggests that the boy learn on his own, and shows him the available skills on the system panel. Betrayal, stealth, and poisoning. Zhou Yi ponders the skills and concludes that betrayal and poisoning would not be very useful for him, unlike stealth, which is the specialty of a thief. The impatient master asks the boy to choose quickly, as he wants to go back to drinking. He then chooses the stealth skill and asks the master if there is any mission he can perform to practice. The master, irritated by his audacity, belittles Yi, saying that his missions are not for a novice who is still at level 5, and demands 10 gold coins for teaching the skill. Discouraged, Yi realizes that this place does not have normal NPCs and decides to leave. As he heads towards the exit, the other players around him mock him, saying his level is not good enough and that he is not the Death Star, they suggest that he go to Wolf Valley to practice before trying to level up. Meanwhile, the thief master observes Yi leaving the bar with a sword on his back, questioning what a thief would do with a weapon like that. The girls around him agree with the master, highlighting his beauty and skill in contrast with the immaturity of the novices. Ten minutes later, Zhou Yi returns to the bar, throwing a dead wolf on the table in front of the thief master. The girls scream in horror, and the master spits out his beer. Yi now has reached level five, he apologizes sarcastically, saying that the wolf slipped from his hands. Everyone is impressed by his speed. Ignoring the comments, Yi asks the master again if he has a mission for him. Smiling, the thief master points to an area north of the village with easier missions for beginners. Then the master wonders who that boy is. Yi quickly accepts the mission through the game system and goes on his way. Arriving at Dark Ridge, Yi wonders if there really is a dungeon in that location, and if the mission is as easy as the master had said. He considers himself too smart to be fooled by a simple mission. However, upon opening the gates, Yi is faced with something terrifying. He tries to prepare, but it's too late. He falls into an endless abyss, beginning to be surrounded by a strange bluish aura, with various lightning sparks coming out of him. Back at the bar, the thief master smiles, imagining that Yi must have already fallen into the trap. Dark Ridge is not an easy mission, but rather the last and most difficult one in Mingyue Village. The master, with a look full of pent-up anger, was determined to make Yi pay for the embarrassment he had caused. Yi falls forcefully to the ground, causing a great impact and throwing debris in all directions, surprised to find himself in a dark and gloomy dungeon. Trying to compose himself, he begins to notice that several knights emitting a dark aura started to approach him. The system announces that he has arrived at the mission location and has eight hours to defeat a hundred monster knights surrounding him. Looking around, Yi analyzes what the best combat strategy would be. With so many monsters, he realizes that the Hand of God, even combined with the Sword of Damocles, designed for individual combat, would not be enough to deal with them all at once. However, he has an idea, and with a cunning smile on his face, he decides to try throwing the sword like a boomerang in the direction of the monsters, causing it to rotate forward. With this movement, he manages to knock down ten of the hundred knights. The damage is significant, and Yi understands why this sword is considered a forbidden weapon. After retrieving the sword, he prepares, determined to quickly eliminate the threat. Again, he strikes his weapon several times in the same style as before, hitting them quickly and precisely. His sword returns to him, leaving only a trail of his speed, and then Yi defeats all the monsters around him. However, when he collects what appear to be rewards, 
he is disappointed to realize that they are only items of no apparent value. Before he can think more about it, a thunderous noise echoes, and beams of red light rise from the darkness. A monstrous being emerges from a huge hole in the ground, its armor covered in skulls, matching its own figure. Clearly a powerful boss, it questions if it was the insignificant being in front of it that defeated its men, and declares that it will now pay with its life. Yi prepares for the confrontation, his defiant expression revealing his determination. He wonders internally if the boss has the power necessary to bring him down, seeing it as a truly interesting fight. Activating the newly acquired stealth skill, Yi suddenly disappears, leaving the boss perplexed and unsure of where he could have gone. With the blink of an eye, Yi reappears behind the creature and activates the hand of God. A new system pop-up appears, indicating that the theft was successful. Yi looks at his hand, surprised by what just happened. Then the system explains that it is a disguise mask, allowing him to change his appearance and name in the eyes of other players, but warns that if the item is lost, he will return to his original appearance. Kneeling there, the boss becomes furious at Yi's audacity to steal right in front of him. Smoke begins to form on his back as he curses him endlessly. The smoke starts to intensify, and unable to maintain the disguise without the mask, a large explosion occurs, knocking the boss's helmet away and revealing the true form of the Dark Knight. Yi observes the creature, and a new system window informs him that the true appearance of the Great Dark Knight has been revealed, and a special mission has been unlocked to kill the true Dark Knight. The Knight, enraged, promises to dismember Yi and use his skin as a new mask. Yi stares at the monster, questioning internally what kind of creature it was. A wave of power expands as the knight activates his weapon, a dark cross-shaped sword which heads towards our protagonist who barely escapes. He manages to evade by jumping while watching the debris follow the path. He lands on the ground trying to stand firm and then looks ahead determined to survive at all costs. The imposing boss, still surrounded by a reddish energy, seems even more terrifying and threatening, saying, Die quickly. Then the knight advances with fierce attacks, forcing Yi to defend with his sword. With the intensity of the force, he ends up being pushed back by the impact. Yi faces difficulties, as he is not an expert in close combat and is almost being defeated. The knight seems to have opened his mouth, and from it begin to emerge several spiral energy tentacles that advance, hitting our young man several times, Without time to change weapons, he states that he will try one more time with the hand of God. However, he ends up being hit by one of those tentacles, making him cough up blood. Wiping his mouth after the impact, Yi knows he needs to try again, he needs to try his luck. Leaning on his sword, Yi provokes his opponent, mocking his appearance and calling him a disgusting pile of tentacles. Irritated, the boss raises his sword, gathering even more power and preparing to deliver a blow. He says, Shameless little thief, you're tired of living. Then our protagonist activates his ability, leaving a strong glow in his hands and invokes, Hands of God! And quickly strikes, taking the knight's sword for himself. My Bacchus! The boss laments. Yi breathes a sigh of relief after defeating the dark knight with his new sword, Bacchus. The game system displays the weapon's statistics, highlighting its power and constitution. Yi understands that this sword strengthened his fatal blow, the Eye of Death, making it even more powerful. And without even thinking twice, he activated his power to defeat it once and for all. And zigzagging, he advances, using the sword against its own owner. The knight, now disarmed and vulnerable, rages that Yi cannot use him against him since his armor is still intact. Yi disagrees, confident that the great sword Bacchus has increased the damage of his fatal blow enough to be fatal in that situation. Then several blows can be seen being applied against the knight, who lost 19,478 of his life, thinking it was impossible. Still holding the sword, Yi says, with your weapon. In addition to the additional damage from the Eye of Death and the Ten Steps, a fatal blow, nothing is impossible. Being alerted by the system that the boss has entered a violent mode, the knight begins to scream and laugh loudly, making his aura even redder. As he suffered another mutation of his body, creating several eyes and tentacles, the knight said, Stupid insect, how about you play with this? Provoking the knight. Yi mocks his repulsive appearance and states that his armor had been gradually destroyed by the attacks, leaving him completely exposed and vulnerable. The knight, observing Yi's sword stuck in the ground, questions his impending fate. Yi then activates the Sword of Damocles, which flies in spinning motions towards the Dark Knight, successfully finishing him off. A game window confirms Yi's victory and offers him the option to publicly or anonymously announce his latest achievement to other players. Deciding not to draw attention to himself, Yi opts for anonymity, 
The game congratulates him on the victory and informs him that he has won a new golden treasure chest. Eager, Yi opens the chest and feels satisfied with the reward. However, a new pop-up reveals that a secret mission has been unlocked, to deliver a letter in Dreamlessville to someone named Xiao. He is given the choice to accept or refuse the new mission, and he ponders his next actions. Ponders Inside the bar, some men discuss their missions. One of them says that he has recently unlocked a hidden mission and gained a rare skill. Another comments that he is lucky, as hidden missions are very difficult, and this is something to be envied. At the table nearby, the master thief checks the time, satisfied. Since it has been two hours since he sent the novice on the impossible mission, he certainly gave up. As he ponders his thoughts, he and everyone in the bar hear the loud sound of the door slamming and see Yi entering victoriously. The master, completely astonished, does not understand how once again the novice has achieved something unprecedented in his most difficult mission. Who is this mysterious player? He wonders. The protagonist approaches the master and throws a bag with 500 gold coins in front of him, saying that he wants information about a specific place. The master of thieves, still stunned, responds stutteringly that the boy can ask anything. Yi shows the mission paper and asks if the master knows a place called Dreamless Village. The master takes the paper and is surprised by the question, as he knows the place very well. He takes another sip from his bottle, trying to gather the courage to explain. He begins by asking if the boy knows why the village has that name. Without waiting for an answer, he explains that dead people do not have dreams. That place now only has dead people and is more commonly known as the village of the dead. The protagonist reflects on the information, trying to understand what it means. The master continues his explanation, saying that 30 miles west of the beginner's village, there is a tunnel that leads directly to the village of the dead. Every day at midnight, the village appears. It is a desolate place emanating an evil aura, as if it were constantly in flames, something similar to what people imagine to be hell itself. In this place, the weakest monsters are level 25. He explains that in the beginner's village, the highest player level is 20. The boss of the location is level 30 and has a blood volume of 10,000. However, this dungeon is actually an opportunity dungeon. The focus is not on killing monsters, as long as the right choice is made. There is the possibility of obtaining hidden career-changing items, Yi is interested in these rewards. His eyes sparkle, and a smile can be seen forming on his face. However, the master warns that the dreamless village is truly dangerous, and tries to advise the novice not to go, but before he can finish the sentence, the protagonist interrupts him and bids farewell, heading towards the exit. The master tries to stop him, but in vain. Our protagonist considers the information and prepares to face the said level 25 monsters. The master laments, frustrated, because the boy does not take any of his advice seriously. He is not even afraid of the dreamless village. The dawn and the real world are interconnected, and all items from the dawn can be sold and traded in the real world. The Black Dragon Trading Chamber, one of the three largest trading chambers in the country, claims to be able to obtain anything desired. The place is located in an imposing building, right in the center of the two worlds. He arrives at the location with the intention of exchanging some of his items. Upon arrival, he sees his adopted sister with the witch he hates and questions what they are doing together. His sister sees him from afar and asks what he was doing there. She also asks about his outfit, as he apparently awakened to the assassin profession. He lies and confirms it. Before arriving there, he used a mask to hide his true identity. If he hadn't done that, Jiang Xiaoyu, the witch, would have discovered who he is and exposed him. Jiang provokes Yi, asking why he changed from a two-handed swordsman to a dagger wielder. He responds that it's none of her business. They provoke each other until the protagonist's sister interrupts the discussion, excitedly saying that she's going to buy some equipment for him to go through this initial phase of the new profession. Yi refuses the gift, but the witch approaches him and whispers that if he ruins his sister's fun, he can consider himself a dead man. Yi becomes uncomfortable and tense, and only tells his sister not to buy anything expensive. The girl gets excited and asks the attendant to bring the best gear for beginner assassins. Without a choice, the protagonist approaches when the attendant asks. He is forced to try on a ridiculous set of perfect level star armor with an underwater breathing effect at a cost of 200,000 gold coins. Jiang makes a sarcastic compliment, saying that he looks very dominant. The next outfit is even more hilarious, and the witch takes the opportunity to mock the protagonist. Yi's sister continues to show other outfits, while the witch enjoys herself immensely. Two hours later, they find an outfit called the Blood Dragon Trench Coat, perfect level, which adds 50 more vigor and 20 more defense. He is also wearing a perfect level dark shirt, with an additional 20 defense and 30 magic. 
Black Knight pants, perfect level, with an additional 40 vigor and hermit boots, perfect level, with an additional 40 agility. The protagonist is exhausted from all the outfit choices. The witch makes a slight compliment, saying that with that outfit, he's not bad at all. And his sister comments that he looks even more handsome than he already is. He asks the cost and says he'll take it. The witch provokes, saying that for a change he's being sponsored by his sister again. Finally, he gets the equipment he was looking for and can't wait to get out of there. He bids farewell to his sister, saying he's going to the Dawn World to complete a mission. The sister asks him not to stay up late. Yi arrives at the entrance of the Village of the Dead in his new outfit and weapons. The place looks like a common village, with tall tree canopies, mist, and children playing. It doesn't resemble the Master Thief's description. He wonders where the level 25 monsters are. He approaches, goes down the stairs, and passes through a barrier. He approaches the group of children. One of them falls to the ground, and he asks if they're okay. The child responds that they're fine and thanks him. As he turns to Yi, he sees that it's not a common child, but a small monster, a blue-tinged skeleton of what once was a child. The village is in flames and under siege. A child starts screaming through sobs, calling for their parents. The protagonist feels a familiar sense of losing someone dear. They remember when they lost their own family, but that is the last thing they want to recall at that moment. A system window opens, initiating the first mission, kill the ghostly knights and proceed to the true land of no dreams. The protagonist equips the great sword Bacchus. They are filled with rage, for it was those ghosts that massacred the villagers. They wield the flaming sword and declare that those ghosts are not worthy of being called knights. The monsters sense the provocation and realize the protagonist's presence. Enraged, they attack, their eyes emanating greenish flames. The sound of hurried footsteps grows louder, and the protagonist prepares to attack, activating one of their abilities. Amidst all the chaos, Zhou Yi was no longer the same. Before those nights, there was only a mere translucent shadow which still said, None of you scum are worth stealing from. Suddenly he disappears, and the knight's blows cut the wind and hit the ground. Immediately afterward, a powerful crimson shadow unfurls, passing through the creature's neck and leaving it in several pieces. When the skeletons sense his presence again, they desperately flee in his direction, and he continues to strike and cut down the knights. His blows cause so much damage that they were instantly defeated. He puts the sword back on his shoulder, and a pop-up announces that the mission has been successfully completed. The current experience has reached the upper limit of level 20, and the excess experience will be automatically sealed. After completing the hidden mission, it will be automatically unlocked. The second mission is unlocked, and now the protagonist must kill the level 30 Lord of the Undead. The ground trembles and the master emerges, enveloped in smoke and fire. A macabre figure appears. The Lord of the Undead possesses the abilities of Dark Sphere and disperse the weak. An additional note about him is that, unable to accept his death, he was transformed into a ghost wandering the banks of the river Styx. The monster roars loudly, declaring itself immortal and the supreme authority. Without bothering with introductions, Yi promptly attacks the opponent with the Death Eye, a fatal strike. Considering that the creature is already dead, that blow is to ensure that it does not go out and cause harm to others. The monster disintegrates into pieces amidst lightning and explosions. After defeating the ghost, a window opens, informing that two accessories have been received, and one of them comes with an ability. At the top panel, the description of the accessories appears. The bracelet has a perfect level and can summon a skeleton to fight alongside the player. The second accessory appears in the middle panel and is the Ghost Steps, classified as a skill book, increasing movement speed by 30% during activation. The system asks if the protagonist wants to activate the ability, and they immediately accept, considering it too good not to be used promptly. With it, they will have a 60% faster chance of dodging enemy attacks. The other accessory received is the reanimated Lord's Helmet, proof that they had killed the creature. Zhou Yi holds the helmet in his hand, saying, This will be the object used in the next mission. He was in the cemetery of the Village of the Dead, and as he walked, he could see several graves. There, quite close, was the ghost of a girl crying, scared and calling for her parents. Between sobs, she says that the bad guys killed everyone in the village. Yi tries to console her, asking if she is okay, and then asks if she is Xiao Yu. The girl turns around, a little confused, and affirms that she is. Relieved, Yi apologizes for bothering her, and tries to deliver the hidden mission letter. However, the girl becomes agitated, saying that the protagonist went there to hurt her. Visibly irritated, she pushes him leaving him stunned by the situation. He tries to explain, but to no avail. 
His attempts to talk to the girl to tell her that he is not a bad person are useless. The pop-up does not show her level or abilities. I'm not a bad person. Look, I killed all the bad guys who were bullying the villagers, he said as she ran away. Then she turns around and says, Bad people always lie, and summons other ghosts to attack him and defend her. The environment changes completely, and a horde of ghosts surrounds him, furious. The girl is determined not to let anyone get hurt again and orders them to attack this bad boy. Yi doesn't know what to do. He holds the sword, but can't attack the ghosts, as most of them are children. He remembers what the master thief told him, that this was not about winning, but about getting an opportunity. He doesn't want to be like those who attacked the original village, and so he gives up using his sword and lets himself be covered by the crowd of enraged ghosts. After being attacked, a mysterious voice announced that Yi had proven his goodwill. A strong ray of light enveloped the protagonist, and with his eyes protected, he tried to discern the origin of that luminosity. From above, a feminine figure began to descend. Her body was wrapped in energy. She had a veil that hid her face, and an air of mystery. Majestic, she descended, summoning the lost souls back to their place. Yi, curious, wondered who that mysterious woman was. Xi'an, with eyes shining with joy, approached and called the woman Sister Ching, embracing her tenderly. Ching, with a gentle gesture, reassured Xi'an, assuring her that no one could harm her while she was there. Tears streamed down the girl's face as she cried emotionally. Yi observed the scene, surprised to realize that despite her cold appearance, Ching demonstrated infinite gentleness with the children. He smiled, moved, but without wanting to show weakness, he tried to conceal it, coughing lightly. Kneeling before Xi'an, Ching touched her face with an unusual delicacy. Yi then noticed that not only were the two names similar, but the physical resemblance was also striking. Suddenly, Xi'an turned to Yi, asking Sister Ching to help her get rid of the evil he represented. The girl pointed at Yi, full of anger, leaving him in a state of shock. Ching, apologizing for the girl's attitude, explained that she was an abandoned orphan and distrustful of any outsider. A system window opened, offering Yi the chance to start a new mission. Ask Ching about Xiao's past. Without hesitation, he asked about the events in the village of the dead and Xiao's fate. Ching began to tell the story, revealing that one day the village of the dead was known as the Carefree Village. The villagers, tireless and self-sufficient workers, lived in harmony. Xiao, free, ran through the wheat fields while her family worked. Even though they were not rich, they were happy. Everything changed on the day of the attack. When they returned from the plantation, they found bodies scattered on the ground. They seemed like ordinary people. But Yi confirmed that they were the undead he had just eliminated in battle. Ching stated that they were the brutal knights who massacred the entire village after recovering from their injuries. The two were furious as Ching told the story, but Xi'an blamed herself for asking her parents to save the men, which resulted in the death of her family and everyone she knew. The girl began to cry desperately, and Yi felt a deep pain. This is how the village became the dreamless village. All the souls who died there were trapped, cursed by the remorse and obsession of Xiao, who repeatedly reenacted the events. Yi, overcome by sadness, deeply lamented what happened to Xiao. Sadness and despair dominated Xiao, and Qing tried to calm her. Xiao was engulfed by a wave of sadness and anger, unleashing a storm that began to envelop her soul, making her a prisoner of the dreamless village. Qing warned Yi to stay away, or he too would be trapped there. A system window opened, alerting that Xiao's sadness had become so intense that she was facing a storm of conflicting emotions and needed to decide whether to stay and save her or not. The success rate of that mission was minuscule, only 1%. The storm intensified, and Ching tried to reach Xiao, but Yi held her arm, asking if she was not going with him. Ching, with a serene voice, said she could not, as she needed to prevent that child from becoming a callous and inflexible soul. She looked at Yi, saying she needed to save Xiao. Yi, determined, held Ching by the arms and asked her to stay there while he himself saved Xiao. Ching, seeing the determination in Yi's eyes, realized that he was truly willing to save Xiao, regardless of his own life. The protagonist, with his eyes protected by his hand, advanced towards Xiao, each step a challenge against the storm. He approached close enough to yell at the girl, explaining his true purpose, that he was delivering a letter. He told her that the letter had previously been intercepted from a dark knight after killing him and could contain the answer she had been searching for. Xiao, with trembling hands, took the letter and began to read it, together with Yi. Finally, she understood that the village had always been a target, even if Xiao had not saved the men they would have found another way to invade the village. The tragedy that had occurred was not her fault. The girl thanked Yi and said that she could finally leave this world in peace. 
She dissolved into a brilliant and pure blue light beam that filled the entire environment. Ching was moved, letting a tear roll down her eyes as she saw the sweet girl depart, then thanked Yi and thought for having helped Xiao. Shortly after Xiao's departure, the day dawned, and there at the top of the hill the two observed the village from afar and agreed that it was better to leave the dreamless village in peace. She looked at him for a moment, and in gratitude, Ching offered Yi a reaper's medal. The system notification explained that after using it, he could awaken the special profession of reaper, as long as he already had the profession of thief or necromancer. Yi, surprised, asked if it was not a disproportionate reward for his recent deeds, and Ching questioned whether he wanted her to return the gift. He retracted what he said, took the medallion, and gladly accepted the gift. Ching noticed that on Yi's hand there was a ring known to her, the ring of Mo Yu, and she wondered how he was using that. Could he be the person she was looking for? but she decided not to say anything about it at that moment. Then she turned and said goodbye to him. Before leaving, Yi used his charm, saying that she had given him a symbol of love and asked if that was not the work of fate. Ching, embarrassed, could not face Yi. The young man with a smile said he would miss her. Ching, absorbing his words, turned and left blushing without looking back. In a place called the White Emperor's Center, a meeting was taking place behind secret and well-guarded doors. A powerful group of people were discussing the latest events within the dawn. One of them stood up and said that until that moment, twelve professions had been awakened in the White Emperor's city. However, only this year, three of them had died in less than two days, and this was certainly the work of the player Death Star. The group leader, Bai Jung, gave his opinion by saying that he found this obsession with the player ridiculous, emphasizing that he had achieved this through his own merit by being so strong as to kill level 10 monster bosses in just a few seconds, there was no reason to worry about mediocre people. On the contrary, they should be proud of one of humanity's greatest feats. He added that the next time he heard someone denouncing the player, he would personally send the responsible person to the dark prison. Person to the, the head of the Zhao Zhu family spoke up again, saying that he understood the emperor admired demonstrations of talent, but he raised the concern and distrust again that Death Star could be a narrow-minded villain. The city's deputy, Su Heng, took the floor saying that he had sent people to investigate the causes of the deaths, and that until the truth was revealed, the best path was to wait patiently. He continued, adding that if the investigations concluded that Death Star was indeed involved, the Emperor should seek justice for the awakened dead. As the meeting was taking place, a security guard approached, announcing that he had arrived with the latest report from the city. He was holding a sealed envelope and explained that three hours earlier, the investigation group was in a bar when they found traces of the Scorpion Assassin, a Class D assassin from the End Church, and discovered that envelope. The Emperor took the envelope and saw that it contained an extermination order for all the rare professions awakened in the White Emperor's city. The group approached, stunned by this information. Bai Jang furiously punched the table in indignation. Then he ordered that the awakened ones be immediately alerted to the risks they were facing and that urgent support be sent to them. The deputy hesitated and asked Bai for a moment, showing the player Death Star's record and explaining that the player's real name and any other contact information were not listed. Back in his apartment, Yi admired his new medallion, remembering Miss Twing with a smile on his face. His sister approached, snapping him out of his daydreaming, and asked why he had spent the entire morning staring at that mysterious medallion, questioning if he wasn't tired of looking at the object. Yi closed his hand over the medallion and brought it close to his chest immediately. The sister teased, saying that if she didn't know him so well, she would say the object was some kind of love symbol given to him by a girl. The young man was stunned and embarrassed, asking her not to suddenly come up and scare him like that. The sister noticed the nervous blush on the boy's face and asked if she was right. She then hugged him as if he were still a child, expressing pride and happiness to see him finally grown up. He tried to break free from his sister's embrace, saying she was suffocating him and asking her to stop as he would go crazy. The girl left the room naturally, telling him to use the medal to complete the profession transfer first and then come down for breakfast. He fell into the chair, shocked and open-mouthed. Outside, as she closed the door, the sister wondered how long her youngest brother had been awakened and if it wasn't too early to change professions. She left humming cheerfully, thinking about how it was possible her younger brother still needed her protection, being the older sister. Back in the living room, Yi activated the medallion and was enveloped by a powerful red sphere, prompting the system to ask if he wanted to change to the Reaper profession. The young man confirmed, and the system congratulated him on the profession change. His eyes glowed in a reddish tone of confirmation. In his profile pop-up, 
He saw that his new level was 21, that he was in the Reaper profession as his second profession. His hit points were 7,500, magic power 5,800, strength 886, constitution 750, duration 802, agility 960, and intelligence 580. His current skills were hand of God, eye of death, mystery weapon, 10 steps to the fatal blow, disguise and jumping strike. His special weapon was the Sword of Damocles. After the second transfer, each of his attributes skyrocketed. He feels his whole body light and his five senses much sharper. Yi feels like he can break a steel plate with a single punch. An energy takes over and envelops the protagonist in a fierce aura. He runs and punches the wall, creating a huge hole. Debris and flames are seen from outside the apartment, alarming the passers-by, including his sister, who angrily calls his attention for having destroyed her flowers. She orders him to clean everything up before she comes back, or else he won't have breakfast. Insolently, he smiles, not caring about the punishment. He asks where she's going, and the girl answers that she's going to work. He goes back inside the apartment, looking again at his player profile, and wonders why assassins have such low intelligence, as this affects his life in Dawn. The little devil of his conscience appears on his shoulder, saying that this thought is not true, that it is obviously caused by the fact that he and his sister do not have the same bloodline, so she is more intelligent. Yi is annoyed by the thought and punches it away. Turning to his profile, he notices that he has an extra talent bar, two skills and two levels to unlock, at level 25 and level 35. The new Reaper talent is Death Heart Effect, which adds 10% real damage to the target's blood level. This means that, as long as the opponent doesn't have skills to avoid the damage, he can kill them in 10 attacks. When Yi reaches level 35, he will unlock these two skills and become a Master Reaper. He fills with pride at this achievement and immediately grabs his sword, having the idea of going to fight monsters to level up quickly. His conscience returns, startling him by reminding him that his sister asked him to tidy up the mess. He laments and begins his chores. On the street, while taking out the trash, feeling like he's the greatest, a woman suddenly appears asking if he is Zhou Yi. She introduces herself as Zhou Yaya, HR of the Scorpion Guild. She continues by saying that she has heard around that he is awakened to the assassin profession, and that's why she would like to invite him to join her corporation. Yi doesn't mind being a novice, as they have mentors to help him advance quickly to level 4. He just needs to make sure that during this period, 10% of his income is delivered to the guild. She shows him the employment contract and asks if he doesn't think it's a good deal. She opens a button on her blouse with the intention of seducing the young man to go with her to discuss the matter further. However, Yi raises his hands in refusal of the tempting offer and bids farewell to the lady. The woman doesn't understand why her charms aren't working on the young man. As Yi walks away, the girl asks if he doesn't want to think better about the matter and if he rejects her, causing her to not reach the monthly goal, she will be punished. The woman's hand transforms into luminous blue claws and her gaze becomes dark and threatening. She reminds him that they are on the blue star, not in dawn. So if he doesn't want to be surrounded by the authorities, he'll need to lure him to a deserted place. He turns to the woman and says that if they had bumped into each other somewhere else, he might have been tempted to accept. The woman doesn't understand what he meant. So he reflects that every woman who accidentally bumps into him while he's taking out the trash is interested or a snake. The young man adds that he prefers to be with his sister, as he promised long ago to join the guild where she is vice president. The mysterious woman angrily says that his sister is only a vice president, not a president, and asks if he isn't worried about depending on someone else's decision other than his sister. Yi replies that he doesn't mind, as the president is his sister's wife. The mysterious woman finds that interesting and decides to leave him alone for now. She observes him as if looking at something delicious and decides to let him live a little longer, but she will return later when she has taken care of the others. In the Emerald Forest, a level 30 zone, a violet light explosion draws attention. In the center of the forest, a powerful beam of light cuts through the air effortlessly shattering wolves, snakes, and other monsters. Nearby, a player is fighting with his sword against a turtle-shaped monster and is preparing to strike, but at the exact moment, the light explosion hits the monster and kills it instantly. He and other players in the region, indignant, wonder who stole their fights and killed all the monsters at once. They observe a man in front of a pile of slain creatures and wonder if he was the one who killed them alone. Everyone is irritated because the mysterious player is monopolizing all the monsters for himself, and they wonder what is happening. Suddenly, a burst of cutting light passes over their heads, making them shrink in fear. It's the Sword of Damocles, 
which, like a boomerang, returns to Yi's hands, kicking up dust around him. Zhou Yi opens the system screen and realizes that even after three hours of hunting monsters, he has only advanced one level, reaching level 22. That pace would mean at least three more days to unlock the new level 25 skills. For him, that's too slow. The players around hear Yi speak out loud and mock him for wanting to advance three levels in just three days, bursting into laughter. They think Yi is too arrogant to think he can do that, while they took at least a year to reach level 26. They ask who this newcomer thinks he is and if he's got loose screws for thinking he can. Yi calmly crosses his arms and says that wild monster zones are public and anyone can kill monsters according to their abilities. One of the men whose monster Yi stole complains, saying that it is the majority who decides that and the monsters in that area belong to his guild. Another takes a bow and asks his brothers to stop talking to the newcomer and attack. They all agree that debating with the newcomer is pointless and decide to attack together. Joe takes a defensive stance and with a grim look challenges the group to try to defeat him all at once. The group attacks with their weapons and Joe defends against each blow. He breaks the arrows fired at him with his bare hands, dodges the sword strikes, and then draws his own sword, warning the group not to underestimate him so quickly. With a single strike, he disarms and knocks down the other players. The single blow creates a scene of shattering blades, groans of pain, spraying blood, cries of surprise, and an electric, thunder-like expansion of Joe's sword. The player who is farthest away curses Joe and rushes in for a quick attack, leaping at him. Joe quickly perceives the approach and asks if the man is seeking death. He plants his sword in the ground, triggering an electricity explosion that hits the player, delivering a powerful electric shock that makes him bleed and scream in pain and despair as he falls to his knees. The men still standing kneel in surrender and beg for forgiveness, pleading for mercy and admitting they were wrong. Yi sheathes his sword calmly, as if nothing happened. The men still kneeling begin to idolize him as if he were a god, promising to never oppose him again. They offer their devotion and call him father. Yi looks at the man he struck with indifference, finding the excessive worship strange, and asks if they truly wish to redeem themselves, suggesting they tell him if there is a faster way to level up besides hunting in the forest. The injured man reveals there is a rumor of a secret kingdom in the Emerald Forest, and that they were ordered by the guild leader to find this place in that area. Satisfied with the information, Yi turns his back and warns that if they don't want more trouble with him, they should stay out of his way. The surrendered man, introducing himself as Keaton, tells Yi to be careful. In the background, one of his brothers calls his attention, concerned that if the guild president finds out they leaked the information about the secret kingdom to a stranger, they will be in trouble. Keaton, with a vengeful expression, questions Yi's strategic knowledge, mentioning a tactic called the mantis pursuing the cicada with a bird behind. He is still resentful towards Yi for humiliating him in front of his brothers. One of Keaton's companions suggests they leave Yi alone and depart. However, Keaton, with an expression of hatred and vengeance, promises to recover the lost honor against Yi. He tells his companions that he will allow the newcomer to try to find the secret kingdom, but if Yi finds it, he can count on the help of the guild leader to kill him, so that everyone can see who will be called father. In the depths of the Emerald Forest, in the Miasma Swamp, Yi wonders what he is doing there again. Is there really a secret kingdom in this ghostly place? He wonders. A system window opens and congratulates Yi for unlocking the secret kingdom of the werewolf mission. This mission is 30 to 44 stars of danger. The area is infested with bloodthirsty and dangerous wolves. Yi has three hours to complete the mission, gain experience, and receive rewards. Zhou Yi is pleased to face high-level monsters grouped in this restricted zone. The protagonist crosses the portal of the secret kingdom, believing it will be an excellent training ground. Fifteen minutes later, Yi exits the secret kingdom, and immediately a pop-up congratulates him for completing the secret kingdom of the werewolf mission on the first attempt, sending the rewards directly to his backpack. Calmly, Yi comments that the difficulty level of the kingdom was low as a training ground, and that the rewards were probably just common items. When opening his inventory to check, Yi is surprised by what he received. A white wolf fang at level 40, a Jing Hong necklace at level 30, a teleportation scroll from the werewolf secret kingdom, and a two-handed sword at level 40. He is impressed by the quality of the items received, and sits on a rock to analyze the kingdom and its rewards. His backpack is almost full, as the space in the kingdom is limited. Yi studies each of the rewards received so far to free up space, deciding to melt the Damocles sword and the skeleton sword into materials, as they are mid-level and will no longer be useful. He sells other mid-level items, such as a wolf pelt, at the smelter. The system quickly shows several level-up alerts, reaching level 31. 
Yi finally unlocks the level 25 magic ability, the Crow of Death, which allows him to transform into a blood crow and fly into the sky. He can launch up to 72 high-altitude feathers, immobilizing the target for 10 seconds, an effect that cannot be resisted or fought. Yi is excited about his new ability and can't wait to test it. While Yi was meticulously analyzing the game system, he heard the heavy footsteps of a crowd rapidly approaching, creating an atmosphere of growing tension. He recognized the group as the same men he had defeated earlier. One of them pointed accusingly at Yi, accusing him of stealing secret information. At his side was an imposing man whom everyone called the boss and who was evidently the leader of the guild. This man was Killer B, the feared president of the Level 40 Morrowind Guild. Keaton, standing next to B and full of resentment, angrily pointed out that the newcomer had not only found the secret kingdom, but also managed to pass through it and take the rewards the boss was looking for. The boss, in a threatening tone, told Yi that it was not too late for him to surrender. Indifferent to the threat, Yi firmly replied that he would not surrender, and revealed that he had been waiting for them since Keaton's bald brother had traded information to save his own life. B confronted Keaton with fury and asked what was happening there, leaving Keaton desperate, denying the accusations and calling Yi a liar. With a sudden movement, Killer B placed his armed hand on Keaton's head, who began to stutter desperately with fear. Enraged with the subordinate, the boss activated his weapon and asked if Keaton thought they were equal, just because they had the same hairstyle. With a slight pressure, he crushed Keaton's skull, killing him instantly. Keaton's lifeless body fell to the ground, causing a shiver of horror in everyone around. Killer B, filled with deep hatred, ordered Zhou Yi to hand over the teleportation account of the Secret Kingdom, promising to spare his miserable life in exchange. Yi felt the boss's strength, proportional to his level 40, and became slightly nervous but did not move. The guild men closed in around him, brandishing their weapons in a threatening manner. Yi saw there the perfect opportunity to test his new magical ability. With all eyes fixed on him, Yi transformed into a crow, leaving behind a small explosion of dark, dense smoke. The muffled sound of the transformation echoed across the field, and a light breeze scattered the smoke. Yi took flight rapidly, leaving his opponents perplexed. The men were confused, searching for him like dazed cockroaches, while Yi observed them from above in his crow form. The boss demanded silence and ordered them to search for the boy claiming he was still nearby. Zhou Yi realized that the crow form had its own hidden abilities, but he wanted to test if his previous skills could be used in this form. So he activated the death's eye and was able to see the weak point of each of his opponents down below. He noted that the boss's weak point was his hands, now understanding why he wore protective gloves. With the boss in his sights, Yi decided to use the powers of the hand of God to steal his ability. Immediately, the hand of God was activated, and Yi swooped around Killer B passing by his hands and successfully stealing the blood contract imprisonment ability. A faint hum and a blue system window confirmed the successful theft of the ability. Yi was surprised by the effectiveness of his ability on the first attempt, but he did not fully understand the function of this new ability. What does this contract mean? He wondered. The boss, sensing something at his side, activated another ability, the blood aura sense. Red beams emanated from his eyes, illuminating the environment with an ominous light and he quickly pointed to the sky in the direction of the crow, staring intently at Yi in his hidden form. He ordered his men to kill the crow. In the same instant, Yi activated the death crow ability and launched black feathers over the group, immobilizing them for ten seconds. The sound of the feathers cutting through the air in their gloomy glow caused a brief moment of panic. The boss was not hit and had time to invoke the blood contract. A black smoke came out of his hands and grabbed one of his men, using him as a human shield against the feathers. Yi learned that the blood contract ability allowed enslaving anyone within a 500-meter radius. He deactivated the crow's power and began to return to his human form in the air, descending with his sword in hand. The sound of the wind around him increased as he fell, and when he landed, the ground trembled slightly. With his sword activated, Yi knocked down more than half of Bi's men with a fierce glow. On the ground, the boss observed the boy from behind and commented that he did not imagine a newcomer could be so strong. Eyeing Yi's sword, he threatened to break it to obtain valuable materials. The remaining men were captured by the blood contract when B activated it again. They became a kind of zombies, manipulated by a reddish-black smoke emanating from the boss's fingers, like puppets. Yi witnessed the ability in action and found it interesting. B, with the expression of a raging beast, announced that he would make Yi one of his blood slaves and that he would use the boy's sword to clean his teeth. Yi assumed a dark aura upon hearing about his sword of Damocles, and became enraged. 
Until that moment, he did not want to kill B, but he changed his mind. He took the teleportation account in his hands and activated it. The portal opened to the secret kingdom with a cracking sound and a bright glow. Killer B began to laugh, mocking the boy for thinking he was so scared that he had decided to flee to the secret kingdom. Yi passed through the portal, and B, along with his slaves, ran after him. Upon arriving on the other side in the land of the werewolves, they were greeted by bloodthirsty monsters. B, laughing, asked if Yi preferred to become wolf food rather than his blood slave, but Yi's plans were different. The werewolf commander appeared, threatening the human intruders. It was a fierce level 40 creature, with 80,000 health points and 40,000 magic, with abilities like claw rush, howl, and wolf attack. An extremely powerful and intelligent creature, the perfect weapon to kill B and his blood slaves. Yi smiled and activated the stolen blood contract ability. With the contract successfully made, a wolf began to howl as it was enveloped by the ruby energy of our protagonist. It knelt before Yu and asked him for two instructions. Without mercy, Yi pointed forward saying, Kill those intruders for me. In response, the eyes of that wolf were filled with energy, confirming the request. Completely frightened by the situation, B asked himself, What? How did that boy get my special ability? Yi's wolf growled fiercely at B's group, which advanced, biting and eliminating one by one. B, desperately running for his life, ended up tripping on one of the roots of the place and falling to the ground. His pursuers were still behind him, with hungry eyes. He turned to the front, still unable to compose himself, and saw the shadow of the imposing creature, beginning to plead, Please, let me go. I'll give you all my treasures. Flying through the sky, a bird-like creature wrapped in purple energy was seen releasing more and more feathers, which were carried to our protagonist. Yi was standing on the wolf's shoulders, holding his shining sword, saying, Don't you want my sword of Damocles? I'm going to make that happen. From the sky, a powerful energy surged, and an explosion occurred. We could only see Bee's head between the sharp teeth of the beast, while Yi sheathed his sword, declaring, Serves him right. Then he passed through the portal, returning to an alley in another city. The system informed, The disguise mask item has been equipped, and the player can now change their nickname and appearance. Without delay, Yi pressed the button, confirming the change of his nickname. He emerged from the alley completely different, holding his backpack while stating that it was getting late and time to go home. As he walked back, Yi encountered Zhou Yaya, the red-haired woman, trying to persuade another person, Moling, what you have awakened is a rare witch profession. Come to our Scorpion Guild. The benefits are guaranteed. You won't find a place like this if you miss this opportunity. A crow observed the scene gliding from above. The woman bid farewell, saying she would think about it, and then Yaya also bid farewell, asking her to call when she was interested. It was then that Yi decided to follow her. He saw her enter an alley and start changing clothes. Seeing her bare back, he noticed a scorpion tattoo. Feeling observed, Yaya turned around startled and asked, Who's there? However, the only thing he saw was the bright light of the street lamp. He thought, I keep feeling like someone is watching me. Funny, my assassin instincts have never been wrong. At that moment, Yi's eyes widened as he discovered that she was an assassin like him. After changing clothes completely, he was able to identify that she was a level 40 second degree assassin. Assassins were essential in high level monster team battles, so how could he become just a common HR recruiter? As she walked, something shone on her arm, and she was surprised to see that her prey had responded so quickly to her message. She activated her bracelet, and a person called Mo Long said, Yeah, yeah, I've made my decision. I'd like to join your Scorpion Guild. She thought it was great, and asked to meet immediately somewhere to sign the contract. Mo Long confirmed he would send the location, and she left humming. Yi continued to follow her. In a Yoni Ming specialized hotel, a hand fell to the ground unable to move, and a weak voice asked the reason for all this. It was the same woman Yi had seen earlier near the coffee shop. Next to her, a white envelope had fallen. Licking her dirty finger with blood, the assassin said, because if many people awaken to rare professions, how can they still be called rare professions? She bid farewell by slamming the door, leaving Mo Long's body behind. Yi, who was observing everything, thought, Indeed, I was one step behind. This woman attacks quickly and precisely. She is definitely not as simple as a mere HR recruiter. If I had fallen into her trap, it would have been me dead here. Desperate with his wings, he can't even imagine how he dials his sister begging her to answer, urgently pleading that nothing could happen to her. 
But what was happening there was something completely different. We were taken to another hotel called Spring. Under the night sky, there was Xing Yu Yi's sister, taking a hot bath with an intimate friend. The sweet blonde girl held her face while saying, I haven't seen you in just a few days and your bust has grown again, Xing Yu. This brief moment was interrupted by her phone ringing desperately. Xing Yu started to walk to answer, but the friend hugged her, asking her not to answer. Annoyed, the blonde girl said, That boy Zhou Yi is already so old, but he still stuck to his sister all day long. It's time for him to have his own nightlife. With a simple smile, Xing Yu suggested it could be an emergency. However, the friend attacked her with a big hug, stating, I don't care. Anyway, today is my birthday, so you can't think of anyone else. Loving that little jealousy attack and the pout she made afterward, Xing Yu approached, held her friend's face, and said, Xiao Yu, why are you so jealous of my younger brother? Meanwhile, on the other side, Yi kept his ears attentive to the phone call, not understanding what could be happening, since his sister never took so long to answer his calls. Several things started to go through his mind. What if something happened to my sister? If something happens to her, I will kill you with my own hands, he said as he flew towards the car where Yaya was, in the best upscale neighborhood of White Emperor City. There, a peculiar scene was taking place. A man was humming while Yaya was on her knees, crying, listening, believe in our Lord, and live forever. Yi realized at that moment that they were lackeys of the Church of the End. Shortly after, they were both sitting and talking. The man said, Venomous scorpion, you've caused quite a stir by killing people in White Emperor City, and Bai Zheng has become suspicious. She smiled and stated, There's nothing I can do. I received orders from my superiors to continue killing until I find the Star of Death. The crow remained alert, knowing that the Church of the End, one of the ten major cults, was composed of fanatical followers who wanted to destroy the world, and now he was actually being targeted by them. The group leader, Zhou, who was at the earlier meeting, pointed his finger and said firmly, What does killing a dozen novices who have awakened to rare professions have to do with you finding the Star of Death? But she insisted, I'm sure the Star of Death is among these twelve novices. How else would I have gotten my hands on the forbidden treasure chest? It was then that Yi realized that he really had such a high value, but he wasn't sure if he really deserved it. Still listening to the conversation between the two, the leader asked, Why are you so obsessed with the Star of Death? And then she answered, Oh, my superiors think the Star of Death is the key to resurrecting the Lord of the End, but I don't care if our Lord is resurrected or not. I just want the forbidden treasure chest. At that moment, Yi was completely taken by surprise, as they said that the forbidden treasure chest could unlock legendary artifacts, and possessing one of them could make someone the most powerful person in the world. Faced with this, he began to channel energy into his hands, thinking, If I could get it, Bai Zheng in the city of the White Emperor would be no one. I will take down the Death Star and take his treasure chest, and then kill the venomous scorpion so that the treasure chest will be mine alone. He then asked, So, do you have any clues about the Death Star, venomous scorpion? She showed the photo of our protagonist and asked him to help her, as she suspected he could be the Death Star. This left our protagonist alarmed, as how could she know that? The man took the photo, saying, That boy seems insignificant, at most a bit handsome, but she unaware of the leader's intention behind his words, replied, He is immune to my charm, perhaps even stronger than me. I have a feeling it could be him. He smiled and said he would investigate. Zhou Yi then realized that everyone was conspiring against his sister, something he would not allow. He would not let the cultists go unpunished. Suddenly they spotted an intense light coming towards them, alarming everyone. Yaya stood up, asking what was happening, and soon realized that the bird had followed them there watching her in a strange way. In a surprise attack, the man invoked a skill, the Tower Shield, making his hand fill with red energy. A red tunnel fell from the sky over them as he shouted, Whether you are human or bird, you can all go to hell! The boy was so disturbed that some people passing by the area were alarmed, asking if they had heard what was happening. The clan leader was surrounded by red energy, and the system warned, Tower Shield Level 60, Skill Effect, Shield. This is the exclusive skill of the warrior, which invokes an isolated battle zone to prevent external interference. Duration, 30 minutes. The woman activated her skill, exclaiming, Zhao Jun, did you just stab me in the back? He replied, Hey, who wouldn't want something as good as the forbidden treasure chest? Above them, Yi watched everything, incredulous that they had started fighting each other. Yaya's anger intensified, and her energy took the form of a dragon. 
How can a useless shield warrior like you capture and kill an assassin like me? I'm not weak, she said. The fight started to intensify more than Yi had imagined, and he decided he needed to flee from there. His attack was received and blocked by the clan master who claimed, Venomous Scorpion, I have awakened three times and am twenty levels ahead of you. His body was golden. This ability transformed him into a shield, restoring his full life and making him immune to physical damage. Yaya said, I'll teach you why trash is called trash. With the dagger in hand, she moved so fast that using the lightning blast skill, consuming 20% of her resistance to increase her movement speed and attack the enemy. With force, Joe Jim pressed his body, making various debris move on the ground. Yaya had to jump away from him to be able to continue her attack, and in the eyes of Zhou Yi, he thought, calmness and flexibility in the face of danger? This is the strength of a level 40 assassin who has awakened more than twice? Jim advanced towards her, laughing, saying that this was more than he expected. But if he wasn't good enough, the church wouldn't have put him in charge of their meeting. He spun his sword like a fan propeller as she approached more and more. She rose up, gathering all the strength she had, and attacked from above. Both collided in a movement that made the silence reign in the place. Zhou Yi thought, I need to take advantage of this opportunity. And then, at that very moment, he used Crow Death, with the effect of launching 72 feathers in the target area from a high altitude to hit the target. The person hit by a feather would be immobilized for 10 seconds. This effect cannot be immune or counterattacked. At that moment, they both let go and running, Jim thought, is this crow here to help me? But I don't remember the Zhao family keeping crows. Many wealthy people in this neighborhood have created monsters. What kind of pet could it be? Until then, one of the feathers hit the woman who, incredulous, could not believe she would be immobilized for a while. If you enjoyed today's recap and want more Manhua content, subscribe to the channel. We're starting this journey now, and I hope that together we can strengthen this new community. So go ahead and like the video, comment for future parts, and share it with your friends. Thank you so much for joining us, and until next time.